Once again, grateful for each and every one and their presence this evening, the opportunity to worship with you once more this day. And as we get into our lesson this, this evening, I want you to consider with me the thoughts that surround the reading that Matthew shared with us just a little while ago. We're going to be talking about Noah and his example and what he set for us. I want to begin this evening, even before we get to the introduction itself, and I, I want you to really, just for a moment, really look at yourself. I mean, really look at the true and honest self. Don't put up any kind of a, a barrier wall, a facade, or anything like that. Don't, don't, just make this real, real. Just get very honest with yourself. If every person you know... Every person in this town, in this county, in this state, every person in the United States of America, if every person in North America, the Western Hemisphere, and everywhere else in the whole world, except you, rejected that book. Hands down, no more. There's no more God, no more creation, no more anything. Would you still stand with the Lord? It's a tough question. It's a tough question. And, and, I, and I think it's one of those cases where well, I better answer it the way the preacher wants to hear me. <laughs> yeah, I, I want you to say yes. I want you to say yes. It's a tough question. We've not been put into that position, but sometimes in life we are called to stand alone. Sometimes in life we are going to be in a situation where we're the only person in the room that is pursuing righteousness, that is focusing on God, that is believing and embracing the will of the Almighty. We're going to be that only person. And we're going to have to stand alone. And it's in those moments where you may not be the only person on the planet who believes, but you are the person there in that presence who believes, and you've got to stand. And it doesn't mean that you need to be make a big radical display of it all or anything like that, but you, when given the moment, cannot compromise. You must stand. And so sometimes we're called to stand alone. We're going to look at, I believe, an inspiring record of this very thing when it comes to Noah and what he shares with us is the fact that we can be inspired that regardless of how alone we may be at that moment that we need to stand with God because with God we are never alone. We know that Noah in particular was alone in a world full of people that the entire population, as far as we are told, it tells us, and even as uh, was read earlier, Matthew read for us, that the Lord looked at the world and the entire world was corrupt except Noah. What's interesting to me is that it doesn't say except Noah and his sons. <laughs> it says except Noah. Now, you can argue, well, that's the way that it's introduced in the story and that's how it needs to be a biographical you know, storyline, blah, blah, blah. Well, just doesn't say anyone else, but we do know that it was not long after the introduction to Noah that his family's introduced and they're standing where they need to be. But these individuals were alone in the world. When we're introduced to Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 8, it's the simple statement, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord was displeased. God Almighty was displeased with all of mankind, except for, as it's declared here in this particular place, Noah. And so these few words, what they declare for us is Noah's righteousness before God. And Noah's strength in the face of difficulties. And also Noah's courage to stand alone, regardless of how alone that alone may be. I think those things are very valuable as an example. So when we consider Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, we discover just how strong and courageous Noah was. He was willing to stand alone against that entire world. He and his family were willing to be different for God. And that's really the lesson. That's really the point. We're going to look at this. We're going to revisit the record of Noah. We're going to seek to be inspired by his character, by his courage, by his Example. So let's consider these things. First of all, Noah stood with God. As I said just a moment ago, anytime you're with God, you're never alone. God is the greater power and the greater force than all of the rest of the population combined. And so even in that case, you're stronger and better off with just you and God alone. I am grateful for the fact that I'm not called to do that. I'm grateful for the fact that I can look out here and see like precious faith. 
that we're standing together in the truth. And we're not the only ones. There are many, many of our brethren meeting even this hour in this country and in the world pursuing the truth of God. But Noah stood with God. Genesis chapter 6 is what uh, Matthew read for us, verses 5 through 9. And in Noah's time, we're not decisively told how God communicated his message, but I do know this one thing. God had communicated to Adam and Eve a law. Do you remember that? You know, it was very simple in what we have of it, but the law was you can eat of any of the trees of the garden, any one that you want, eat them all, eat, eat everything of it, except you cannot eat from the tree there in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot eat that. So that is a law established by God. That is a moral code given from God to man. Now, God only can expect us to follow His will when He has revealed His will. God is not one who pounces on people and say, why didn't you do what I expected without telling us what He expects? And so we know that law was given in the garden, that law was expected of mankind, because even as was shared in verse number 5 of Genesis chapter 6, when God's displeased, they were obviously not following His will. We do... We understand that in this particular case, when God looked down at the world, everyone had rejected His way. God had obviously revealed His will to mankind in some way, but they had rejected His way. And that, that is, of course, everyone except Noah. We know that this was a long time before the law of Moses. The flood happened a long time before the law of Moses came around. And so I want us to understand and embrace the fact that God has revealed His will to mankind separate and apart from the old covenant. And we know that the new covenant is for everyone everywhere. And so the whole world populations included in the hope and promise of the new covenant as long as they embrace it and become part of it themselves. But again, back to Noah, we know that this is a long time before the law of Moses, but we also know that Noah was listening to God. Noah was heeding the word of God. And so with that in mind, we understand that that's what allowed him to be pleasing to God. That when he feared God, when he kept his commandments, remember that Solomon said that in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, that the purpose of our life here on earth is to fear God and to keep his commandments. And that's always been the case, even all the way back to the, God, the time in the garden. Fear God, keep his commandments. You know, it's really difficult to walk with God. It's a difficult way to be when it seems like we're doing it all by ourselves. And again, that's one of those situations where that's not going to happen here in this environment. You're never going to be by yourself here in this environment. But I don't know anybody that lives inside this building. You know, you don't stay here seven days a week and 24 hours a day. You got to go out there. And out there is where you may be away from your brethren, away from those of like precious faith, away from those that heed God and keep His commandments, and you're going to find yourself being alone. And it's going to be a challenge. It's something that we need to face. And even though it was very literal for Noah, we might face that a little less literally, but we may face that in our real lives. Noah's strength and independence is put even to more of a test and I want us to see that. Join me over there in Genesis chapter 6. I don't know if I encourage you to get over there yet or not, but I'll give you a moment. Old Testament uh, references sometimes takes us a little while to zip over there. This one's pretty easy. It's the first one. First one right there, you know, Genesis chapter 6. Look what it says over here. And let's share together these words. And it's a little bit of a lengthy reading, but bear with me and we'll work our way through. Beginning at verse number 11. It says... <clears throat> The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the width, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. 
You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set a door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. You know, uh, just a side note, I just think about it. Every time I read this verse, I think about this. When uh, I can't, I think it was Haley. When Haley was a little baby, one of the notions we took for her uh, bedroom slash nursery, wherever she was sleeping during the day, because at night I know she was with us. But anyway, nonetheless, <laughs> that's just the way it works. But anyway, sleeping with a windmill. But nonetheless, we had these Noah, Noah, Noah's Ark kind of decorations, and not one of them was scriptural. All of them had all these windows down the side and giraffe heads sticking out and all this stuff. Not one of them. How many windows were in the ark? How many doors were in the ark? You know, look what it says here. It's very specific and it's important for us to know that. Verse number 17. And behold, I myself am bringing flood water on the earth, flood waters, excuse me, on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, and keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive." And you shall take for yourselves of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Interesting, and now again, a longer reading, but when we look at this, think about this for a moment. Noah was alone in offering sacrifices to God going over here to an altar that was built to, to please God and offering sacrifices. We might assume that's part of the situation because we know after the ark, after he comes out, that's one of the first things he does. And you can kind of keep that to yourself. You know, you can kind of be over here in your own little covey, your own little world. Here's your you and your sons and, and your wife and their wives and you're kind of in your own little area and you're offering sacrifices and you can kind of keep that to yourself. I'm sure lots of people had fires going. But now the challenge is to make a spectacle of yourself by building a gigantic, for better term, or lack of a better term, boat. Did you kind of calculate how big this thing was? Let's talk about that a little bit in this challenge that Noah has. God declared His plan. His plan was to destroy mankind and everything else as well, all of the animals as well. If you ever wonder why they find fossils of mammals on top of mountains, well, I believe it's because they got carried there by the waters of the flood. Makes perfect sense to my mind, and, and I don't know why I would argue with God's flood uh, as it's recorded in the Scriptures. But here it is. Noah's receiving the plan. He's going to destroy the earth. He's going to destroy all of the inhabitants of the earth. He's giving, along with this promise of destruction, also a promise of hope. And I want you to understand that because this parallels our life. There is a promise of God's destruction of this world. It is promised and it will happen, but also along the lines with that is a promise of hope. And, G and the Lord provided for that. God always brings those opportunities for us. A plan through which Noah could be saved. And the plan was an ark. So this is a massive project. Impossible to complete without noticing. Now he could offer sacrifices all day long and people may not know why he is burning the barbecue. All right? They might not know why he is offering those sacrifices. But the reality is they're not going to let this go. They're not going to just say, well, I don't know what Noah's building over there. Maybe a tool shed. I'm pretty sure they're past that. Such a structure is going to get attention. Such, such a, an ark or a boat, as it were. Think about the, what's going to happen here is he's building, he's building this giant structure, this giant boat, and all of a sudden, the people are going to see it and they're going to ridicule him and, and mock him. It's not easy to stand alone when what we're called to do is going to be noticed. And I want you to think about this for a second. And we're not the only ones that may face that weakness. Think about Peter. Okay, Think about the Apostle Peter way over the New Testament. 
after the Gentiles had been included in the covenant, after they had been taught the gospel, after they could embrace it and become Christians just like the Jews. And then he was eating at a table with Gentiles and then some prominent Jews showed up and what did he do? The pressure was on and he backed away. Pressure came on. He didn't want to be that person. He didn't want to be noticed for embracing the will of God. It's interesting. Here's a situation when this standing out from the crowd is really noticeable for Noah. Look what it says in verse number 22. I know you kept reading because if you've ever read this before, you know the best part is verse 22. Did you read that? Look what it says there. Thus Noah did. I think those are very, very powerful words. But it does continue on. According to all that God commanded him, so he did. He was willing to do those things, even though it drew attention to himself. Noah shows us that we can. Noah shows us that we can. If he could, we can. Now, this is one of those things that I think is so important that, that we embrace this understanding that the people in the Bible record, the history timeline of Scripture, are real human beings. They were not all endowed with supernatural powers to re resist temptation and, and be like superheroes of faith. That's, these are real people. When they cut, when they were cut, they bled. You know, they breathed in and breathed out. They faced difficulties, we face difficulties. They had good days, we have good days. They're real people. Noah was a real person. I think that's the greatest lesson from the record of Noah and his ark, is that we're capable of doing whatever God asked. Whatever it is that God asked. When we have a situation, and I don't know if you put yourself in that, maybe if you're like a, if you're like an employer, okay, you're the boss, and, and you find somebody and, and you've, you've brought them on board and you've employed them, and you just, you know it from your years of experience, your wisdom, your insight, whatever it is, you know they can do better. They, you, you just know that they have more ability than what they're giving you. And so what you do is you go over there and you incentivize it. You know, you say, I really need you to step up. I really need you to do this because, you know, they can do it now. Even more so, think about God. Think about God and his knowledge of you, his knowledge of your abilities, his knowledge of your strengths. And then when God gives you something to do, how in line is that with it? When we understand and we embrace the capability of doing whatever God asked. I, I really think that we should take courage and just refuse to excuse ourselves from whatever it is that God expects of us. You know, imagine the difficulty of the task of building the ark. I think it's just, it's almost beyond imagination how, how difficult that would have been. And God asked Noah to do it, and it was incredibly difficult. The ark itself, now I don't know if you dimension this in your mind or not, but it's bigger than this building. Do you get that? The ark is way bigger than this building. And I don't mean this room, I mean the entire building. It's 450 feet long. That's a football field and a half long. It's 75 feet wide and it's 45 feet tall if a cubit was what most people think a cubit is. About a foot and a half. Now, what's interesting to me is that that, to me, would be a difficult task. I mean, just think about what it would take to do that. When we think about the dimensions of it, the, the size of it, the, the task of it, the burden of it, it's a massive undertaking. But again, Noah was willing to do what was required of him. And so from the moment that we learned that there was a man named Noah, we we're introduced to him as a man who listened to God. And that's part of chapter 6, verse number 8. His example is of trust and faith. Trust and obey. Didn't we just sing that together? Perhaps it's to this point that Noah 
had only offered those sacrifices, those little things that God required of him. But now there's something huge that's been set on his shoulders, his responsibility. He's told to build this massive ark. He's told to enter the ark and wait, which I think would even be more of a challenge. Get inside and I'll seal it up. Stay there. What a challenge that would be. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Noah simply did what God said. Is, did you notice that? Now look over there. I, I know you have your Bible open still, but look at Genesis chapter 7 and beginning at verse number 1. Let's take a, take a read at those first few verses there. Genesis chapter 7, verse number 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven of each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two of each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to each of the species, uh, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah did it. He went into the ark. Noah trusted the Lord. He gave that trust to the Lord. And without question, we don't, we don't see anything in the record of him going, well, Lord, do you really think that's necessary? Uh, do you, do you, you know, really convince me now. He doesn't say that. The Lord tells him to do it, and he simply did what the Lord said. God, you know, God only ever expects what we're capable of. There's nothing in the gospel hope, there's nothing within the will of God revealed to us for our time that is beyond our abilities. If it seems like it's too much, that's your challenge to rise up. If it seems like something that you cannot do, maybe that's your challenge to push yourself to gain that. If it doesn't seem like it's enough, you know, I know some people that are just superstars. You know, they're just superstars about everything. They're going to do awesome at everything they do. And they come along and they go, well, that gospel message is too simple. Well, you, what do you mean? Just confess Jesus Christ and be baptized. I want something spectacular to do. Think about Naaman back in the Old Testament, remember? I thought, I thought for sure Elisha would come down here and wave his hands around or something. You know, something to get attention to me. And Naaman was really bent around about me, <laughs> me, me, me. But you know, we need to just understand when it doesn't seem like enough, that's my challenge to, to be humble and trust the Lord and obey Him. Noah inspires us to do all that the Lord commands. With faith and trust, we can do it. Noah was safely delivered. And I think this is absolutely important for us to, to see God follows through with His promises. We don't have a God that makes promises that we hope will come true. We don't have a God who, who speculates at the possibility of maybe. We do. We live in the possibility of maybe all the time in our life. We don't have a God that speculates in the possibilities of maybe. Maybe. You know, never once does the Holy Scriptures reveal to us that Jesus Christ shed His blood for you that you may be paid for. You may be able to go to heaven one day. It doesn't say that. The only may be variable in any of that is our own decision making. But we need to make proper decisions so that we can be like Noah and be safely delivered on the other side. What was the end result of Noah's trust? Look with me in Genesis chapter number 8. Okay, look it over here in Genesis chapter number 8. It says, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restricted. And when the waters receded continually from the earth at the end of 150 days, and the, water, the waters decreased, and the ark rested on the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, in the, mount, uh, in the mountains of Ararat. And so here it is that the ark has been floating above the whole earth, above the mountains 
15 cubits above the highest mountains. It was floating up there, and now the water is stopped, the rain stopped, the water subsiding, and it comes to rest on this mountain area of Ararat. And uh, as it continues on, and I want you to see just a little bit further, I'm going to spare you from reading all 19 verses, but I want you to come over here, and it says in verse number 15, Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. And I just want you to take note of this, and I know it's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek, but they survived 150 days together in one building, and they're still alive. Just take note of that. It says, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark, safely delivered on the other side of the flood. What an incredible plan that God did for mankind and for us. Because at that moment, I suppose it was within his will, if it, within the possibility, I just have to speculate on that a little, but the, within the possibility for him to just say, it's done, I'm done. You know, one family's not enough. I'll just bring them on home and I'll just destroy the whole works. But he didn't. He gave them a plan and delivered them through. And here we are. He trusted God enough to enter and to stay in the ark. I think that was a real big deal for him to, to trust God enough. And now he was alive. He was in a renewed world. And when everyone else had perished, he was there. He was there standing with God. I, I really think there's a lot of similarity between Noah's particular situation and ourselves. What we have, our plan and our hope. God has given us a plan. Not an ark. You don't go home and start buying gopher wood, whatever that is. Uh, I'm not really familiar with it. I don't even know if people recognize it particularly as a species anymore, but nonetheless, not an ark, a church. God's plan for you to be saved is a church, the church, not just some church. Jesus Christ, in Jesus, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, I will build my church. And that's what we need to be part of. We need to enter his church and stay in it. Do you get that? If Noah would have taken some of the tools that he built the ark with and cut a big hole in the door so he could get out, do you think he would have survived? Do you think if he would have tried to force the window open and jump overboard, if he could have swam to somewhere safe and been okay? He had to stay in the ark. He had to stay there until the time was right. And we have a plan. We have a church and we need to stay. Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23 tells us if we hold fast the faith, if we hold fast that which we learned in the beginning, we're going to find ourselves in a new world too, but not here. Not here on the old good old planet Earth. We know when the Lord comes back, that this earth is going to be destroyed, but there's going to be a place that we are intended to be, that you were designed to be in. Your spiritual self in an eternity of a place called heaven, a new world, that's what we're going to have and be delivered to. Noah encourages us to, to face the task. If God gives us some responsibilities and some burdens to bear. They're going to be burdens that we can bear. No matter how great it may be, we can do it. He demonstrates diligence for us. That's what Noah showed us, that we can be diligent like he was diligent. He exemplified the effort. It wasn't easy to build the ark, but he did it. He gave the effort to do it. He showed stick to -itiveness. There's another one of those words that can't fit on a license plate. You know, but the reality is we can have that same situation. Now, some have argued according to the the wording in there that it took 120 years to build the ark. And that, and that I think there's a good solid reason to accept that. But, but 120 years, think about a project that takes you that long. But you stay with it. And you don't give up. And you don't, you don't back down when people make fun or poke at it. He showed stick to -itiveness. God has made some requests of us, you and I. We know that we can do whatever He asked. 
So today, are you motivated to do God's will? Because Noah was more than motivated to do God's will. He was active in it. To seek Him no matter the cost. What, what kind of cost do you mean? What do you mean cost? I don't mean money. I mean standing for the Lord no matter who refuses to stand for the Lord. That's part of the cost. So that you can be safely delivered. We're going to have to endure this life. We're going to have to do it. And I'm so grateful that it's not just eight of us. There's some congregations that only have that number. We don't. Our spiritual family is big and strong. And needs to be big and strong. And help us out. Because we need to be safely delivered from this world to that place that we're intended to be. The opportunity is yours even now to become a Christian or to return to the Lord as you should. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave His life for you so that the plan of God for you to be delivered from sin, to have the wonderful hope and blessings and protections of His gathering, to stay faithful all the way through your life so that you can find heaven one day, was made real, was made actual by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because see, sin costs. And sin costs the greatest thing that we have. If you have all the money in the world, you'll still give it away to save your own life. Life is worth more than anything else. And not one of our lives, not one of your, yours or mine, not one life that we have is worthy of the price that was given because we've all corrupted our lives. And that's the mess we're in. But Jesus Christ lived a life that was perfect. He gave His perfect, innocent life to pay the price for you and for me. To make the plan real. To make it actual. So that if you this evening are willing to stand up and say, no matter who denies Him, I confess Him. For you to say, no matter who wants to entangle me in sin, I reject and repent the sin that's around me. I submit to the water of baptism regardless of what the world says about baptism these days so that I can rise and walk in the newness of life. That I can become part of what we're striving to do here in this place. This evening, if you're not yet a Christian, become one. If you are a child of God not living the way you should, fix it. Fix it. Get back in where you need to be. In the safety of the Lord's church and in the hope of heaven. Embrace those things even tonight. If we can have you come to the Lord or back to the Lord, let us help you as we stand and sing.